So there might not have been sound from that video on your end, but the crowd was going nuts. Um, the crowd is going nuts because what he's doing is what they're looking for in, in their device experience. And they don't have it so far. Um, so he innovated the multi-touch gesture. He turned, he created that product. Uh, and then basically, um, Apple came along a year later and said, hey, look, we did it too. Actually, I think um, when I share this with you afterwards, you'll notice that Apple uh, also takes credit for inventing and reintroducing the multi-touch gesture. So that same year, Google releases the first generation of Android. So what we see is not only are multiple, multiple gestures possible, but um, the iPhone is a new innovation, right? An entirely glass screen with no buttons. And Google standardizes the operating systems that phones are gonna be working on. And so those three huge shifts in 2006 and 2007 created the conditions in 2017 that we now see where straight out of stats can, the average Canadian household, 76% uh, have a smartphone. Uh, between 2014 and 2016, that increased by 38%. Um, and we're seeing those big increases every year. People are more likely to buy a smartphone than they are any other type of device probably because at this point in time, they just kind of come free with your cell phone plan. Uh, a, a majority of houses have a laptop or a netbook, which we would think is not touch interactive, um, but we'll see in just a minute that those are probably also likely touch interactive devices. And that those uh, groups actually already, 54% uh, of the, the population has a tablet or an e-reader. So this even beats out desktop computers. What we're seeing is that the standard desktop where there's a mouse and a keyboard is being replaced by devices that are touch interactive. Um, and I have a good guess that those laptops or netbooks are touch interactive because the research says that approximately 80% of the operating systems on our devices are touch responsive. So when I say 80% of the operating systems, when you, if you were to click through that link, it would show that uh, uh, the vast majority of devices in Canada are Windows-based devices. And every Windows operating system has been touch responsive since Windows 8.1. So Windows 8 and Windows 10 are both touch interactive operating systems. They assume that you have a touch screen on your laptop. And most Windows devices, most Windows laptops now come with a touch screen. Uh, the remaining you know, proportion of the devices that are out there are either uh, iOS, so Apple, or Android tablets or smartphones. Or we did just see Google launch the Pixel Book, which is a touch interactive Chromebook. So we can start to expect that touch interactive devices are gonna become the new normal. And the projections kind of reflect that by 2020, the use of conventional desktop is expected to decline significantly, somewhere lower than the 30% threshold. Um, and of the people who now, you know, that 50% um, that now have a, a desktop computer, I wonder how many of those com desktop computers are kind of sitting in the corner dusty as people do more activities on their tablets, laptops, and smartphones. I don't know. Um, I don't know exact numbers on that. I don't know if anybody would be able to share exact numbers on that. Um, but what we do know is that the vast majority of what's out there is touch interactive. And yet, do we expect a touch interactive experience in our teaching? So, this workshop is intended to kind of look at how we could uh, work with touch-based teaching devices, whether you have a mobile phone or tablet, whether you have a laptop, or whether you're like um, our institution, which is moving forward with building in uh, touch interactive projectors into all classrooms. So um, we're, our standard classroom installation here at Conestoga is a touch interactive projector. It basically turns your projected screen into a tablet on the wall. Um, it's sort of a version of a smart board without having to have a board. And I am really curious to hear what other colleges are doing in terms of touch interactivity. You know, do you have smart boards in your room? Do you prefer uh, smart boards over interactive projectors, why or why not? Um, and I hope that we'll have the chance uh, or the opportunity to share those examples right now. 
Are there any questions or would anybody like to speak to their own experiences at this point? Feel free to turn on your mic. Gina, are there any questions in the chat window? Uh, no questions, um, yeah. but Sarah, uh, Sarah is saying we have some HP Touch interactive projectors, but not sure what they are called. Mm -hmm. um, so we have Epson ones. Um, I don't think that they're unique to Epson whatsoever. Um, it's, if the HP ones are, are good and you're flying with them, then that's fantastic. I hope there will be a couple of strategies today that you might be able to use with the HP ones. Um, I tried to make this workshop uh, broader scale. I didn't want to speak to just the Conestoga experience in here, but I have to give a nod to the fact that we do have, uh, you know, a lot of colleges have either invested in smart boards. We started at Conestoga with some Pana boards, um, and that was a, an interesting experiment, uh, which is like a physical board, more like a smart board that's a physical board uh, mounted to the wall, and you can only use specific pens on it. We've really found uh, any kind of interactive projector to be a nice flexible option for bringing touch interactivity into the, the teaching and classroom experience. So, Sarah, it sounds like you all are doing some cool things, is what I'll say. So, one of the things that I do in my role at Conestoga is I coach faculty on how to use those interactive projectors, but by nature I'm a teacher, so I like finding strategies that are sort of fail safe and that you can use across the board. So my favorite strategy that you can use with any touch interactive device is live annotation. And um, what I usually suggest to people is that live annotation means that you can now draw and doodle on top of your PowerPoint um, like they're a whiteboard. And you can see, you know, if you've used the functionality in PowerPoint before, there's a pen tool built into PowerPoint. You can choose and select your pen tool. And then you can do things like, say, for example, pull up a T chart on your PowerPoint slide and list off the pros and cons. Sorry, my uh, cons. You'll see that I write over stuff a lot. I don't get into the eraser function very often of various topics, you know, let's list through these together. Or you can pull up something like a Venn diagram and you can compare topic one and topic two and the differences and similarities among them. And this type of live annotation, a lot of people look at it, sorry, and uh, they say, you know, that's not too much different from what I'm already doing on the whiteboard. Uh, and they're right, it's not too much different than what you're already doing on the whiteboard, except that it's savable and it's co-constructed. So when I exit out of my PowerPoint, I'm getting prompted, do I wanna keep these ink annotations? And then when I'm looking at the file, it's now got those ink annotations stuck here. I can save this and provide it back to my students. Not only that, but I'm probably taking strategies that engage students in uh, the collaborative participation in building these uh, graphic anna annotations or graphic organizers with um, these annotation tools. Now, Microsoft is very good, and I'm, I'm going to speak to the Microsoft context because, uh, you know, most of us at, at the college level have likely Microsoft installs or Google, you know, maybe that's the case, but many of us use Office and Office 2016. And this pen ink annotation tool is not, um, is not just related to, I'm just gonna pull up my screen, not just related to the PowerPoint experience. So you can actually pull up any Microsoft product so this is Word, for example, and in the review tab, there's this function that you'll find here called start inking. And the start inking tool brings up a, a host of pens, highlighters, erasers, selecting objects. You know, the pens have a variety of widths and colors, but what it lets you do is start to um, construct maybe those graphic organizers on a pad of paper, what feels like a pad of paper instead. Uh, and if you can do it, you bet that your students who, you know, if they have Office 365 or they have Office 2016 or 2013 installed, can do this type of live annotation strategy. 
If you are blessed with also having a cloud infrastructure and you're using Office 365 accounts, students can do this live collaborating with each other on the same document. So this is not necessarily a one person in or one person out kind of structure, um, but it's kind of really nice to have the flexibility to look at content and say, hey, I can actually draw on this as though it was a pad of paper right in front of me. Um, another function that some people like is the function called ink to math, um, where you can actually type in, whoops, I'm going to clear that because that was not good. C squared equals A squared plus B squared. That didn't do a great job, so I'm going to try typing it again. C squared equals B raise equals a squared plus b squared. Now it didn't catch exactly what I was trying to get at with that plus sign, so I can actually select and correct that into a plus sign. And so there we go, I've got text that I can now insert into my document if I need that to be rendered as text. Um, so in that sense, it can be rendered readable for screen readers. Um, and, and I do hope that uh, with collaborating with accessibility services, we can take this type of live annotation and turn it into something like class notes, or that maybe there's a note taker in the room who will be able to support students. So, uh, and I have to promise you, you know, um, this review start inking function, if it's available in PowerPoint and it's available in Word, it's also available in OneNote. Actually, it started in OneNote because people liked it so much they pushed it out to all the other products. It's available in Excel, it's avail available in Visio and Project. All of the Microsoft products um, have this live uh, touch interactive assuming feature in their, their software. So I'm just going to stop sharing that for a moment and check in with our chat group. Um, and let's take a look. Somebody has mentioned uh, that they think this could be beneficial for accessibility needs. Um, and we do have the su suggestion that uh, it would be pretty impactful if I could show you what live collaboration on that uh, document looks like from an Office 365 experience. And that is, that's, I would love to show you what live collaboration looks like in that particular context, but it's not a context that I knew that um, necessarily everyone who tuned into this webinar would have. So I didn't want to focus in on that. But what I do have planned next is an activity where we can take a look at, um, uh, where we can take a look at, uh, live collaboration in one of a few different apps that other people may be exploring. So I'm going to ask us next to go into um, one of the more popular classroom apps that's out there and take a look at what uh, live annotation looks like in that app. So if you're feeling brave and you want to come along with me, I'm going to invite you to come into Nearpod. Maybe you already have the app on your phone, or maybe you know to go into nearpod.com. But I'm gonna start sharing my desktop, my screen. I'm just gonna share my screen. I feel comfortable with doing that. And I'm gonna go into my Nearpod lesson. And please, Gina, if you don't mind, let me know if anybody can't see my screen. I think it's sharing right now. Let's check. No, I don't see the screen at the moment. Oh, I forgot to click a button. There we go. I should be sharing now. Now we see it. <laughs> I wonder sometimes. I don't always do everything perfectly, but I do make the effort. Um, okay, so my Nearpod, if you go to nearpod.com on whatever device you have available, can be your phone. You can just use the browser on your phone. It can be um, your laptop if you have one in. I see Sarah's successfully in here. When you go to nearpod.com, it's going to ask for the code XVTIC, XVTIC. And so what one function that's in Nearpod, and Nearpod is well beloved uh, to a lot of people in education right now, and one function that I really like is that there is a live annotation function that's built into it. So I've asked the question here, 
what are some, let me just close that, what are some of the types of concept maps or graphic organizers that you might have used in your teaching? Sorry. Draw one and share it with the group. So I see I've got about nine people in here right now. I'm just gonna refresh my page because that was, it was acting yucky for a second. Um, but go ahead and use the opportunity and just draw it. Draw one graphic organizer or concept map that you have used in uh, your own teaching concept. Um, and let's explore the varieties that you may already be um, reflecting in your own teaching. Let me just pull it open again. Unshare. There we go, close. Okay, so I've got Sarah, I've got Lisa in here, Brian, Suzanne, Jen, wonderful. We have a posse of people in here. Now this is not going to be as beautifully live um, based on my screen share as what you may see in front of you. You may already see some submissions that people have added. So as soon as you hit submit, you will be able to see um, people submissions and actually what I would probably do is I'm, I would for my students I would hide their names until I know that they feel comfortable uh, sharing their contributions with this big of a group. Um, but you can see that I've got a few that are pulling up in here. I've got a little T chart right here and if I want I can pull that open and share it with the entire group. Oh, beautiful, I have some Venn diagram going on. You know, just a simple opportunity to use whatever draw-based device you have. And it could, all, it could honestly look like some of you being in your room, um, using your mouse, uh, clicking around to draw. Um, so there is some flexibility in this tool. And it's really nice. Oh, I've got some mind map. Yeah, concept mapping tool, mind map is fantastic. And I think it actually does a great job on mobile. So some of my contributions are text-based, some of them are, are visual, right? I've got um, another T-chart right here, or what looks like a T-chart. I've got like a flow or a process diagram, which is fantastic. Um, but what I love about this tool is that it shows the multitude and the variety of students' contributions to this. Um, I don't know if your school is like ours, but we have an interesting blend here at Conestoga of uh, domestic students, mature and retraining students, and international students. And you know, they have such varied technical capabilities that you really don't know how to predict what they're gonna come into your classroom with. Like for example, in Waterloo Region, uh, in grade nine every year going forward from last year, all grade nine students are issued a Chromebook. So all grade nine students, you know, in four years, every student that we get who is a domestic student is going to be very comfortable with using laptops in their learning context. And those laptops, as we just saw, are probably likely to have some touch interactivity to them. Um, our mature retraining students, though, that's a different context. They probably interact with computers mostly at, uh, at work or at home for fun. They may not have a lot of computer aptitude. They're probably fantastic at field-specific software and computer use. And then what we're finding is that among our international students, particularly uh, many of our demographics are from India, um, those students are, are still submitting handwritten assignments at home. And so the only device that I have a pretty good guess that all of my students are bringing to class is a smartphone because they're normal with a cell phone plan now. And uh, I've moved internationally and based on my own experience, the first thing I did when I moved to a different country was go to the cell phone store and get a cell phone so that I could talk to my family. Um, so with that in mind, you know, Nearpod is a great tool. We know that all students can access it if all they have is Wi-Fi and, a, and whatever device they have in the pocket. Um, they can contribute a wide variety of, of ideas and suggestions to a topic. And in Nearpod, I've chosen to show the live annotation, but that's only one of the tools that it offers. But look at this beautiful variety that I'm getting from all of you. Uh, and I hope that that felt like a fairly straightforward experience for you to be able to make this contribution to our presentation. The one limitation that I would identify with Nearpod is that it's still just you on your device 
offering me a contribution as the facilitator of this workshop. And I think there's actually more potential here for touch interactive devices. I think that we can do better. So let me go back into my PowerPoint and just pull it up again. I'm gonna minimize that. And I'm gonna pull open my next slide. Uh, Gina, just let me know if, if you can't see this one. Oops, I didn't quite finish my slide. So we know that annotation can be a high value teaching tool, but the research says that um, things like virtual whiteboards, which are usually called content neutral tech, right? They don't care what you put into them. They promote self-reflection, they make learning visible, they have students sharing thinking processes and making connections and are linked with higher order thinking. And so when I'm looking at an annotation tool, I'm looking for those criteria. Uh, where is the, where is, are my students being asked to engage in self-reflection or where are, they, where are they thinking about what they do and don't know? I don't know that you, I think that in, in Nearpod you had the chance to contribute what you already knew, but did you have the chance to maybe collaborate with your peers, not with me, with your peers, um, on presenting something that they may not have known about or uh, sharing ideas among each other. Did you have the chance to be multimodal? I would say that Nearpod is, is somewhat multimodal in being able to submit uh, drawings. However, is it multimodal in that you could also submit speech or uh, sound bites or um, is it multimodal in that the learning might be social? I don't know that it necessarily was unless I facilitated Nearpod that way. Uh, does it engage you in solving problems? In that circumstance, my question probably could have been better in that Nearpod example, but I was just asking for you to submit an idea. But where we get high value from annotative tools is if we ask students to use them to solve problems. So, with that in mind, um, I did take a look at maybe another application of live annotation um, where, you know, typically we ask students to solve math problems. And, and math is, a lot of the times we just say, here's the problem, did you get the right answer? Flip to the back of the book and check. But math is really about the process and thinking it through and solving the problem and maybe collaborating with someone when you're not sure what the next step is. Um, and so I wondered if there was a tool out there that might be more collaborative, that might tick some of those boxes. And so one that I explored, and based on how that first video that I showed when I'm not optimistic <laughs> about um, being able to show you this next video, but we'll give it a try and we'll see. Um, one that I experimented with is Explain Everything. So Explain Everything is another whiteboarding app uh, it lets you live annotate, but it has some fundamental differences to what, um, uh, to what Nearpod offers in the sense that it does offer collaborative opportunity. So I'm gonna pull open my explain everything that I was working on. Sorry, there's all my research, just in case you were curious about that. I'm gonna pull open my online whiteboard. Um, and I don't know if you're going to be able to hear the audio from this. And I would really like you to hear the audio from this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and share you the web video link before I play it. And if you would like to um, watch the video on your own system at your own pace, um, but I will play it from my device as well. So let me just pull open the chat. It'll be good for me to just kind of check in on the chat and see if there's anything I should know. And to everyone, there we go. So there's the link to my video. I was trying to test it um, uh, earlier and it wasn't quite working. So um, I will check that later. But let me just play a video that I constructed uh, with my partner last night. Keep in mind, we were both very tired people and this was try like 37. But here's what we were able to do with Explain Everything. So let me just set up this question that we were just talking Thanks to Open the Whiteboard. And so, I think I'm understanding C. 
them, and I was able to solve for a few weeks. I don't think that I'm correctly understanding um, how speed and velocity velocity are different. Um, like I know the formula, but I'm not exactly sure. But I think speed and velocity, and then um, we can tackle the problem together. like the speed at which this bird is going north. So that's my understanding. So so even though speed was like the distance that they traveled as they were actually traveling this. Okay, let me try raising the volume on my computer. Is that any better? The velocity is the speed at which they transition from point one to point two or point A to point B? So then, so when we talked about it, we talked about velocity is displacement over time. Um, and I guess my thinking was that like displacement was like literally being displaced and going around something. But here is just the transition between the point of starting and the point of completion. Okay. So then really displacement is just um, the, sh the shortest straight line between two things. So it's that 20 meters between point A and point B over that original 10 seconds that the bird was traveling, right, that took to travel, even though they went around the tree. And so it still works out to be about two meters per second um, is the velocity. Oh, so it needs a direction. Okay, so I'm going to um, just stop sharing that. I apologize if that was kind of painful for people. I am not a math person. Um, my partner is not a, a math person. We just tackled, um, that is actually a, a sample of a question that I did get a, from a faculty member in a, a first year course. But um, explain everything is much different uh, than, than Nearpod. It does ask or facilitate two people interacting or more people interacting in the same whiteboard sphere space. It lets them record it. It lets them trim down that video and then it lets them share that video so that that person, the person that my, my partner was pretending to be. Maybe some of you were imagining that that would be you as the guide on the side, but it could just be a peer. Uh, and in fact, that's the ideal world that we want people working on is solving problems with peers. Um, and what I would have the opportunity to do as the instructor is just watch the video and offer intervention, uh, right? Like I probably have some really poor concepts uh, yeah, it could be really good for virtual tutoring. Yeah, you're right, Gina. Uh, I hope that that is something that some of you may take it in. Um, you know, I, I don't have to necessarily intervene for, for that student on, the, on remembering that velocity travels in a northward direction or requires a direction because their peer did that for them. But I can tackle the bigger question of, do you really understand what displacement is? Um, and I can get into that gritty by presenting a problem to the whole class. If I'm noticing that trend among all of the explain everything videos that my students have shared with me, um, and I can correct course, or I can strategically intervene with just the people who seem to be misunderstanding that concept while I allow the rest to proceed to the next concept that seems um, achievable for them. 
So Explain Everything is kind of a fundamental shift. Um, Nearpod was really about producing the touch interaction, but Explain, a tool like Explain Everything lets people touch interact together on their device. Um, in this circumstance, you know, I was in one room and my partner was in another, but those two students could have been in two different countries uh, and doing that exact same task. They could have been in the same classroom, uh, sharing the same strategies on the same device as well, right? We, we plan for, we hope for a one-to-one one one device ratio, but we certainly don't assume it. Um, but I really think that something like Explain Everything might have a bit more power and a bit more oomph behind it when it comes to the value that that touch interactivity is providing for our students. So I'm going to pull open my PowerPoint again, because I like going back into that. Um, actually, I think it's on my desktop now. And I just want to touch on uh, the next slide. I am definitely going longer in time than I thought I would. But I want to come back into the idea that content neutral tech, right, virtual whiteboards. Um, they're promoting self-reflection. They make learning visible sharing thinking processes, making connections, and connected to higher order thinking. So Nearpod, maybe you can get it to work for you that way. Um, I certainly think that there's opportunity there. Explain Everything is fantastic, um, but Explain Everything is only free to an extent. Uh, I don't want to create the misperception that these are the only two apps out there that can leverage this kind of collaborative um, sharing there, you know, but I don't necessarily know your school's context. What I know here at Conestoga is again, we're a Microsoft school, we have cloud-based collaborative opportunities. So we could use things like Microsoft Whiteboard, which is actually another free uh, whiteboarding app that any person could download. You don't have to have a Microsoft um, login to use it. Or we could be using OneNote class notebooks here at Conestoga to do this exact same collaborative effort. Um, and those would be free tools that any of us could access. And so I'm willing to believe that there's something relatively free out there that might uh, be available to you to, to bring in those kind of strategies into your teaching or to facilitate that among your students. Another thing that we want to think about, and I'm, I'm going to kind of leave it here, although I'll share the PowerPoint afterwards with you so that you could uh, see where I was going to take it, uh, is that there's high value gestures. Basically, one thing to keep in mind is that if you could do it with a mouse click, you're still not as getting as much value out of that touch interactivity as is possible. We know that um, touch interactive debate devices are capable of really flexible rotation. They're capable of a pinch zoom, right? We saw, um, we saw Jeff demonstrating the pinch zoom and the rotation at the beginning, and they're capable of multi-swiping. Uh, in fact, there's one finger swipe, two finger swipe, uh, three finger swipes, and four finger swipes setups. So when I'm looking at an app or when I'm looking for touch interactive um, functions, among products, I kind of want to see how does it leverage those individual actions? Do they have any potential here? Um, is there anything that I can do with the, the higher value gestures like these that might be more impactful for my learners? Uh, and that was again something that I liked about Explain Everything. Uh, at the beginning, you saw me, you know, pinch to, to minimize the, the problem, move it up into a space in the, the uh, whiteboard that I could accommodate and then go ahead with um, with my annotation and drawing. So those are kind of things that I look for or I bet when I look at things like virtual manipulations or virtual manipulatives. It's not just about live annotation, but live annotation is certainly um, an inroad or a starting point that we could work from to bring touch interactive devices into our teaching experience. Now, I had wanted to take us into some FET interactive simulations, and I had wanted to take us in to look at something like GeoGebra AR or Math VR, um, but we just don't have too, too much time left, and I really wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to share experiences, what's happening out in uh, at your school with, um, with these touch interactive um, devices and, and opportunities, and, and where would you like to see yourself take this? So I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now, 
And oh, I wasn't showing my screen the whole time. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm not a pro level facilitator, am I? Oh my gosh. So, um, what would be uh, what would be um, your take on some of this? I'm going to put back up the PowerPoint since I was doing it incorrectly. I've always forget to hit that share button. This is my uh, my trouble with uh, with Zoom. I'll put up the PowerPoint and I'll offer the time to talk or share ideas. Um, is there are there any questions that I can answer? Are there any things that that you would like to talk about that we haven't tackled in this webinar? I know it's a short one, so we don't get to go too in depth into things. Inclusion. Um, I have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, the uh, inking feature, I was trying to try that out while you were uh, talking about it, the, the one that's available in Word. Um, I do have access to Office 365 online and also the locally installed Microsoft Word. I think we have 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see that feature in Word. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you've tested it on a non-touch screen versus a touch screen. Yeah. Yeah, it is intuitive. So if it perceives that you have a touch device available to you, then it presents that, that choice. If you don't have a touch interactive device, then um, it doesn't present the choice. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I know. I want to I wanna give the whole world tablets and, uh, and uh, uh, touch interactive devices, but I think this is something to be planful of or to pull out of your toolkit when uh, you do have the opportunity. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking the question. Um, are there, I see there's a few more questions in the chat box. Let me just check in on it. Lisa says that you may be able to add it to the menu, uh, but I would wonder if uh, it might kind of predicate on being having a, um, a touch interactive device. So let me just scroll up. Uh, any substitute to typing, <laughs> Fatasia says, is usually better. Uh, Fatasia says, this semester is providing feedback using audio files. It's working well. Good to know about interactive annotation tools. It provides variety. This is really about variety, and uh, live annotation is really scratching the surface of touch interactivity, but it's really where we are at and where we are capable of, right? When we look at AR and VR, it's fantastic to think about, you know, what are some apps that I could be using, you know? It's fan the that simulations from uh, University of Colorado and Boulder are already there, so we could be leveraging those as uh, virtual manipulatives that we can demonstrate in class for our students. But, um, you know, GeoGebra, AR, and MathVR, those are forefront, uh, and they're not perfect yet, but they're really good. Um, and so if, if you had the opportunity to pull in something like that into your math teaching, it would be fantastic. If you found something that relates to your specific discipline or field and it incorporates gestures like touch, zoom, swipe, multi-gesture, um, multi-gesture interactions, and it incorporates collaboration, idea sharing, uh, those type of strategies, then I think you've hit gold, and I hope you'll, you'll share it with the rest of us. Let me check back in with the chat. The chat. How would you recommend using these tools with self-paced learning products? So, Self-paced learning and uh, collaboration, uh, I mean, you're really just looking at allowing something to be asynchronous. So if I was using, um, a, explain everything would be pretty hard to do in an uh, asynchronous context, but something like Padlet is really well suited to an asynchronous learning product. Uh, you can have a Padlet, pre-populate it with a few ideas, and then um, kind of let, let those ideas grow and filter in and, and accumulate as time goes by. And Padlet does as well have draw functionality. So if that's something that you're looking for, it's possible. Can the contributions of various interactions be saved as a final page? So uh, the contributions or the drawing on PowerPoint can be saved as a, on top of the original PowerPoint file. Um, the contributions on Word can be saved. 
Uh, the Explain Everything um, does have closed captioning behind their, um, their paywall. So people would have to purchase a license in order to get the closed captioning, but it can, and it can be uh, shared and downloaded for free. Um, the Explain Everything can also be rendered, I think, as a PDF. So you could save it as a final page. Oh, Sarah, you got, so Sarah got it to work, the live annotation to work on PowerPoint. Yeah, it's better integrated into PowerPoint than it is to other things. Jessalyn, there was a, another question asked by Rachel uh, earlier. Do you have a good resource or list of technologies that are designed for specific purposes? Example, collaboration tools, feedback tools, assessment tools, et cetera. Um, I have a brief list that is kind of always growing. Let me um, stop sharing my PowerPoint and I'll pull open a web page for you, Sarah. So let me uh, share instead my screen. There we go. And I always forget to hit that blue share button. Let me exit out of here. There we go. And um, Sarah, I can refer you over to our teaching and learning website. It's gonna take a second for my page to learn, but if you just Google teaching and learning Conestoga, um, I'll pull mine right up. But we should be one of the first Google results, teaching and learning Conestoga. And you'll see that we actually have a page that's called technology for teaching. Um, I'm a sharer and a carer. I'm first and foremost an educator. Any ideas that I have, I like to just put up there for everyone to benefit from, but nobody knows that we have this on our website. Um, but this technology for teaching page currently reflects um, sort of the climate of ed tech here at Conestoga. Um, I'm editing it all the time. People come to me with new ideas and new suggestions all the time. So I try to throw in some new stuff in here. Um, polling apps, you know, there's a few that we use on a regular basis or that we're looking to use. Um, I don't have one that specifically talks about uh, live annotation, but maybe I can add that to here. Um, it's, this was a, a new topic that I just thought I'd explore at this, uh, this webinar. I'm going to check in on the chat again. Rachel, I'm glad that that worked for you. Um, so yeah, and if all of you, if you at your respective areas have some uh, websites as well that you'd like to share right now with everyone that's kind of like this, I know the University of Waterloo has a fantastic web page on theirs like this. So if you Google EdTech University of Waterloo, you'll come across what they share. Um, I know there's, there's numerous colleges and universities out there that have a page like this on their teaching, on their teaching and learning center. Uh, and it's so fantastic that we're just putting it out there to share with everyone. Gina, I definitely think that this could be something that would be helpful and useful in the EdTech Ontario website, just for the advice, you know. So this by no means captures the variety of touch interaction that is possible on, uh, on our devices, but I hope that there was some food for thought here. Um, again, Nearpod, Explain Everything are two of numerous whiteboarding apps. Explore what's out there and uh, consider ways that you might be able to bring that into your teaching. And look for apps that incorporate more complex gestures um, and more complex cooperation, collaboration, and interaction um, opportunities. That would be my suggestion. Uh, we're really at the forefront of looking at how touch interaction could play in the classroom context.